Uh, so basically, I'm going to talk about solving your big data problem, which is quite a buzzword, I'm aware of that. But uh, a lot of web apps actually are, face, are going to face this problem at some stage. So short story about me, I'm born in London, I've worked for a number of companies, uh, now I live in Berlin. Uh, yeah, so I'm a C programmer from the base, so I did a lot of kernel stuff way back. Uh, and now I've got this new project called dbook. And uh, we ran into these problems, so I thought, why not share it with the world? So what happens if your project actually does become a success? This is something nobody estimates, but it does happen once in a while. And while you're coding, you don't anticipate for this, right? You use one database, you use, and suddenly your data explodes, and yeah, you've got a huge problem. So uh, and then you're sort of thinking, I need to scale. I need to scale this out, We've, we're getting users, all our users are slow. Uh, we've got an article on some big news site and the server's down. And you're like, oh my god, what's going to happen? So what do you need to scale? You need to scale your hardware, obviously. You need to, if you serve it out of your own rack, you need to buy more racks. You need to s s scale your servers. How are you going to have your engines, Apache, whatnot, how are you going to scale that? Uh, analytics, something a lot of people forget most of the time. That doesn't scale infinitive. Uh, you need to scale your software, all the software stuff you have around. Your support. If you get more users, you'll get more support. You'll get more support requests. You need more people answering the phone and so forth. And your network, which turns out to be one of the biggest problems, actually. But I'm going to focus on data today, because that's the thing I'm most interested in, to be totally honest. Uh, and big data. <laughs> and that's enough buzzwords for today. So. <laughs> uh, so this is basically how your data curve looks like, right? At the beginning of your project, you're happy hacking away. You've got your 10, 20 users. Everything scales. Everything works fine. And you're happily, you're, it works. Fast page loads. Everything is perfect. Uh, at some stage, you notice, OK, this is slowly picking up. And then maybe here, you're still in the point where, ah, easy, I'll just add another server. Everything will be fine. And here, you're going to shoot yourself, right? So. Uh, Accounting uh, for the growth of your project is vital if it succeeds. If you're just hacking around on a small project next to your work, don't worry about this. If you actually want it to succeed, if you're actually working on a startup, if you're working in a company, you might have a 1,000 users. In my old job, we had a small project, and suddenly it was company-wide, and everything went down. And then we shot ourselves here, basically. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so account for it early on. So there are a few known solutions for this, big da for this data growth problem uh, by a big single server. I know one big uh, company in Berlin that was uh, selling goods online, and they just bought the biggest server they could get. And they were housing it in this huge server room, and if somebody touched that server, he would be fired. And their whole database would just run on this one huge server. And at night, they had to turn it down, turn it off, basically, because all the caches had to rebuild everything. And then in the morning, they pulled it back up. And this was like, it's a, it's a stock listed company now. <laughs> right? This was their scaling solution for years, because nobody dared to touch this server. Then by bigger database servers, by even bigger database servers. And then somebody says, OK, we might separate the tables onto different servers, so we don't need all our analytics stuff may be running on the same server, and user accounts might be on different server. And that's a fair approach. I mean, if all your tables are the same size, which they normally aren't. So you sort of come up to split data up. And this is the painful bit. And then when you're really big, you write your own solution. So a Twitter, a Google, Salesforce, they'll write their own solution. And that's totally valid, because they've got 200 engineers that do nothing else than maintain this code, write it. But Pretty much nobody of us will have these resources to write your own database. It's really hard. Right? <laughs> uh, I'm not going to leave out cloud services for now. Uh, cloud services have one big problem. You don't know what's happening under the hood normally. So if you use Amazon or Google or whatever cloud service there is, uh, you run into a scaling issue. I, I've seen this many times. We just ran into a scaling issue. It didn't scale anymore, and we didn't know why. We called Google support, and nobody picked up. We're like, why is this not scaling? So cloud services, really be careful uh, when you use this. 
Because if you run into an issue, you're stuck with it. And you have to find a workaround. So I've sort of put this in brackets. Uh, because all the experiences I've had with these is it scales really nice for the few thousand users. And then at some stage, you hit a wall, and you don't know why. And it takes you weeks to figure out how to come around this, or how to solve the problem. So obviously, the first thing is you've got your tables, right? I've simple web app through tables. And easiest thing is you're growing, you're expanding, loads of people. So first of all, I put the database on a new server, and it's still I can grow, it can grow, buy a bigger server, grow, grow, grow. And then at some stage, I figure out that was OK. There's a missing slide. Uh, <laughs> So basically, uh, you split it up in uh, three servers. But the problem is, one table is always bigger than the rest. Your user database is probably going to be quite small, because it's just, I don't know, name, password, and whatnot. But probably your product database, or your accounting history, or whatever, is going to be huge. And then you've got the problem again. You've got one huge server that you need to maintain. And you've got all the small tables on other machines, but you don't really gain a lot through this. So this is sort of a, a very short-term solution. It works uh, for a month, maybe. <laughs> but in the long run, you'll run into the same issue, because you've just sort of taken out a little bit of data, but you've still got this one big. And most uh, projects I've seen have one big table. Uh, it's really weird. So obviously, you want to sort of split up uh, the tables into different servers. You want, to, uh, you want to shard your table, right? And ideally, You'd want three different servers, or n different servers, holding all, all your data. So you have 3.1 here, 3.2 here, 3.3 here, and so forth. Backups would be a nice thought. Uh, so ideally, you would also want redundancy in this. Again, if you have one big database, right, one big table, uh, it's very hard to do backups because you need the same machine again. If you want a hot swap backup, you need exactly the same massive machine that's costing you thousands and thousands of euros. You need the same machine again, exactly as a mirror. And you, you can't get all these funky features with different locations and so forth. So you shard like this. And this is sort of the ideal solution, right? The horizontal sharding. You shard your data, your big data. Uh, you shard it horizontally. You cut it up into little pieces. And you get loads of little advantages. You have more and smaller databases. Through that, you get faster queries. Let's say a full table scan on one shard is going to be ridiculously fast because you're not scanning the whole table anymore. Locking is far easier because you've got different shardings. Uh, you gain caches. Uh, and obviously, you can use probably a lot more cheaper hardware. And if you sort of follow the backup strategy, if one dies, your business keeps running. And uh, you can grow with your data, ideally, if you follow all the rules, you can, I'm going to come to some examples. So we grew to 16 shards really fast, because we could just add new servers, and it would just rebalance itself and scale. The other side is sharding is really, really hard. And it messes you up. You tell your girlfriend or your partner that you're not going to speak to them once you do this. <laughs> it really messes up your life. <laughs> I, I was shouting at people, it, was, it wasn't nice. It's really hard. Getting it right is really, really hard. So enough of the theory. So this is about Django in some respect. So the standard database setup in Django. So who, who knows Django? Who doesn't know Django here? This is maybe the better. Excellent. So I'll go into more details. So basically, uh, Django is a Python web framework, which like, has a model view controller. And you basically, you can specify, this is my database, uh, these are my views, these are my controllers. And it takes care of all the nitty gritty stuff, let's say. Uh, it does the object mapping for you. So you don't really have to care about the database at the beginning of this whole project. You just say, OK, my data is saved there. And for example, here I've got an SQLite instance. So I say my databases, I have my default database, which is SQLite. And the, the path of the SQLite file is here. And then Django takes care of all the rest. It creates the database for you. It, if you, you have updates on the model, it will, create the data, it will update the database for you. It does all that stuff for you. So it's really, really nice to hack up a small project like Ruby on Rails, I suppose, is one of the other alternatives. But then, oh joy, obviously you've got multiple databases, right? So is, when, as soon as you start sharding out, this is like a really simple vertical shard, right? You've got your default database, 
uh, where all the stuff is kept and you've got your user database somewhere else. So let's say this would be appropriate if you have a huge user database you want to keep somewhere else and maybe you even want a different database backend because for some operations you're doing MySQL is more appropriate and the other one PostgreSQL is more appropriate. So you even have this support with the databases that you can even choose the different types of databases you have. For example, we have a logging database that we have a total different database system there because logging has total different requirements, requirements in our transaction database, for example. So uh, through this, you can really easily say, I have a default, I have a user database, save my appropriate models into the different things. Uh, for, all the, for all the Django, python -y people here, very easy, you just say database migrate, and you give in the database, users, and it does it all for you. So this is fairly out of the box, fairly standard stuff. Then this is actually copied out of our config file. <laughs> this can get ridiculous complex. So you see all our data shards here. Uh, obviously, I so we have these on different servers. Here you see that our logging database is on a different port because it's a total different setup of database. And uh, anybody who doesn't know uh, the database URL package should have a look at it. Who knows? Because it's so much easier to express your databases like this and not have this huge uh, dictionary, basically. Uh, so you see we have 16 shards uh, appropriately named by hex. And we have our logging, and we have the default and the dbook database we have for migration purposes. So I'm talking too fast. Uh, but <laughs> uh, if you've got questions, stop me, right? Because I tend to talk quite fast. So, but obviously, how does Django know where to save what? So, uh, so welcome to automatic database routing, which is a really, really nice feature. Uh, I've sort of picked out the two, two obvious things, read and write. So you basically define a, a class, uh, here you say, uh, where you say the database for reads should be and the database for writes should be. And here's a very simple example. Basically for reads, I want to read from my replica servers and I want to write to my primary servers. So let's say you have a simple PostgreSQL setup where you have two replicas replicating from the primary. Obviously you want to write to the primary, which you basically ensure through this. You say database for writes is the primary server and the primary server you specified here, right? You named it primary. And the replicas are the same. You connect to the replicas and then randomly you choose which replica you want to read from. Is that sort of clear before we dig into the depth? Uh, routers can be chained, which is really, really nice. So if one of these functions returns none, so if, if I wouldn't know what to read, I would just return none, and it will sort of chain through uh, the database routes. And um, like this, I can specifically say this does this, this does this, and I can have a default setting which just writes to a default database and reads from a default database. And like this, you can quite easily add load balancing to the whole thing and so forth. Uh, so basically, the most important thing with sharding is uh, the right shard key. So if you want to shard, you need some sort of key to decide where should that data record go, right? So you've got all these, you've got your table, how are you going to split up your table? Are you going to take your primary key, which would be a really stupid idea, I suppose, because primary you just fill up the shards and you just fill them up, which doesn't really help. You'd want some sort of key that keeps everything together, right? You want some sort of what are people going to query at? And this is something that's vital. I mean, this is probably the most important thing when you're doing sharding is find the right yeah. shard key. Uh, most data looks like this in your database. So you really need to find a shard key that separates this really nicely. If you don't find it, you're going to have one, you're going to have one partition or one shard being totally overwhelmed with queries and all the others just idling around and you're actually going to lose performance. So you really have to figure out what is the best shard key, which connects most of the, the data points. So I can play around with it. Take two, three days of time benchmark this, look at your queries, look at what data you're retrieving, look at your code, use Django Shell and play around with it and really look at your data because if you get the shard key wrong, that's it, right? You've shot your foot off. 
So in our case, it was not as hard, luckily. So we have documents, or POCs as we call them, and POCs have millions of, of, of entries. These entries can be historical, so every time somebody edits something, we create a new one. Uh, but we have millions of these. But these are all logically connected, right, through the project. So basically, we said we're going to partition by project because all projects are sort of the same size. Obviously, we're going to have some projects that are bigger, some projects are going to be smaller. But if we take an evil hash, which we did then, we took a hashing function to, to shard these, then we can assume that there will be equal amounts of size on every server. And that's totally logical, right? You add a new randomness to the whole thing and partition by that. Because if you want equal distribution, randomness is the best you can get. So every project gets a project hash, we call it. And from this project hash, we shard. And a lot of, I mean, a lot of blogs, for example, do the same. Uh, Google has buckets and so forth. So this is, and this is really nice because as soon as you access one project, you're always hitting the same database. And because your load is equally distributed, you're hitting all databases equally in load. Does that make sense? Yeah. So basically, um, make it horizontal, which uh, we decided the model, does everybody know what a Django model is? No, probably not. So uh, in Django, you have models which define the way your data looks like. So uh, you have your views, which render the HTML, basically. Uh, and you have your models, which uh, define how your data should look like. So a, a typical model uh, for a blog post would be title uh, being a, a char, uh, string. Uh, you'd, have, you'd have content being a text, and maybe author being a foreign key. Uh, and like this, you can define your model. This is then translated into SQL, run in, run in the database. And so uh, here, you have a very easy router. Basically, for reads, we said if we, we're using the statistics model, then we go to the logging database. Because everything that comes from statistics just goes to logging. And this is pretty much a write-only optimized database. We just push into it, and then we do all the offline analytics from that, but this is not really time critical. We don't want to save, uh, we don't want to save or waste time basically writing through the log. Just push it and it returns commit right away and it's fine. Whereas uh, we really want to get where's my data. But we said, let's let the model decide where I'm going to stay. So if you see, if it's an instance, we get, we call the get shard method on the instance. And this is a get shard method where we basically say, get me the project, then return the shard, which you saw in the database config. You, sh you saw shard one, two, three, and all that. And basically, the first char of the hash tells us the shard. And like this, we have the randomness of the hash, and we can automatically get the shard. And it's a really easy operation to get which shard to pull from. And uh, so another problem with this is, Every time we hit the database router, we, we sort of were hitting the database, right, to find out the project. So every time we were saving something, retrieving something, something, we were always hitting the database. And this was like a massive performance bottleneck. So we just added some caching, which basically says, try to get the project ID. If we know it, we return it. If not, we save it into the cache and we return it. And this is like vital for this whole cache like sharding thing that you're going to run into these horrible things uh, that are really hard to debug, by the way. So, and one of the most painful things uh, is this. Uh, so, how can I put this? So basically, if you've got different shards and you've got foreign keys, you cannot have foreign keys over different databases, right? So all your foreign keys are pretty much invalid as soon if they go over different models, right? Especially as we're doing, as we're doing horizontal partitioning, uh, you can't use a foreign key because let's say this record points to this record. In the future, this record could, could be here and in a different database, even on a different machine, right? We've got 16 different machines. So a foreign key, a join on a foreign key suddenly becomes this whole network thing. Uh, and, they, and it doesn't work. <laughs> I mean. People have tried, it just doesn't. And 
So what you have to do is you basically resolve your, your foreign key to a positive integer, and then you start doing this in application code. And this is like a massive performance bottleneck that foreign keys just don't really work anymore. And you have to write all this wrapper code, you have to write all this stuff to make foreign keys work again. And uh, so basically here is a sort of solution that makes it hurt a little bit less, but it's still not ideal. So what we do is we save the country with country ID as a positive integer, and we set properties as setters and getters. And so basically you have if you want to get the country, you return the object. This will obviously then, because it goes through the router, get the right object. But this, of course, is a database lookup on a different machine. And if we set it, we do the same. We just set the primary key value. This assumes you have primary keys unique in your whole setup, which is something uh, that's, again, another talk for itself. <laughs> I'm just, just assume for this, uh, primary keys are unique for every machine. Uh, something, when people deploy this, they're like, oh, this is really easy. I actually had a programmer tell me, oh, this is a thing of two hours. And uh, then we had this whole, it wasn't, it was weeks. <laughs> because it's really hard in a distributed environment to get a unique key. This is like another really, really complicated thing. And uh, so obviously when we get it in, we set it, and in theory we can get out, but this is like hugely slow because this is another database query. This is the same basically as we have here, that's what we deployed caching, is every time you touch anything in your model, you would trigger a database query, which you really don't want, which is basically dosing the one that holds project, right? Especially we had the case where project was sharded again and doing the same thing again. So actually we had this snowball thing. <laughs> yeah. So this makes it suck a little bit less but it's still not ideal. Uh, yeah, so this makes it hurt, right? That uh, you have another database. And these are the things you have to start thinking about as soon as you have sharding. That you're gonna have all these problems you're gonna run into. Uh, and you're gonna spread the load out, but you're also gonna increase the load quite a lot. So stuff to be careful of is hitting the da database for every root decision, yeah? Yes, we could have done that. Uh, but then we have foreign keys that we know are going to work in that thing. And we so well, in our case, we have this, right? We have the projects, and we have these items. And we know that all items in the project are going to be on the same shard. So in we have more foreign keys in a project with the, the items pointing to each other. Because for example, what we do is, Every time we create a new revision, we create a new item. But what we also have, we, had, we have a doubly linked list. Uh, so we can iterate through all the revisions really fast. Uh, so most of our foreign keys were with items in the same project. And we didn't have so many foreign keys between the projects. So we decided to just say, okay, we're gonna expand the inter-project uh, communication and not the inner, because this has to be fast, right? This is what the user wants. This is what the user wants to see. The user doesn't want to wait hours for history to build up. The user wants the history to be there right away. Uh, so yeah, that's a constant statism we made. We talked about this a lot, actually. Uh, and we were lucky in the respect that we had these projects that had lots of items that are contained space. Uh, social networks, for example, are really, really hard to distribute. Uh, so if you write a, you've got posts with users, but what do you shard by, right? Because users see other posts, you can't really shard by post because you've got all the different users. You can't really shard by user because a user will have loads of posts that he needs to see. So uh, there's a very good paper on how to shard uh, actually like social networks. And what Facebook ended up doing because they couldn't solve it is they would just copy every post onto every machine because they couldn't solve it. They couldn't, when they were growing so fast at the beginning, so every user got their machine and if one of your friends posted something, you got a copy of that post in your timeline, basically. It was a one-to-one -one copy. So if you had a thousand friends and you would post something, it would go onto a thousand computers. Because that was the simplest thing. Because for them, retrieval time of posts is vital, right? They want to retrieve that post list really, really fast. And they want to sort it. They want to do all this funky stuff with it. So they said, data space isn't important. 
we can just buy new hard drives and plug them in. But we can distribute this really easy, and then we contain the posts for this one user, and it becomes embarrassing easier again. So that's a totally valid solution if you're working on a social network. Twitter had huge problems paralyzing their stuff. I mean, they, they've written their own system now, uh, but it was really, really hard. So um, we sort of got around doing it like this, which isn't the nicest way of doing it, but even a programmer that isn't too aware of stuff can use the country field now. And you can use it and you can do stuff with it. If he does a select on it, we're basically fucked, right? <laughs> there, because this will be every select will be a new database call and it doesn't work. So be really careful of hitting the database for every root decision. Uh, hitting all shards is probably the, your worst case. If you're doing an aggregate or something and, so, and you somehow manage to hit all your shards, that's like the worst case because you lose, again, the whole distribution. Uh, dot all for all the Django people will, will not or might not work. Probably it will not work. I mean, I've never seen it work. People say it works. I've never seen it work. You shouldn't use dot all anyway. Any, I mean, it's, uh, what you can do is you can do, you, use the dot using parameter and then say which database to use. And like that, you can do a dot all on that shard but you're not, you're not seeing the whole database. You're only seeing that one shard. Uh, foreign keys will not work. Uh, so uh, you've got this whole new database set up, which is hard to monitor and debug. For uh, somebody who hasn't been doing Django for a long time, this is incredibly hard to wrap his head around. Why is that database going, why is that data record going there and not there? Especially, sorry, when you've got an error somewhere, this is like incredibly hard to debug because you end up having thousands of records and one record is wrong, and you can't find it. You have to hit 16 different machines with their databases on it to find this one record. So it gets really, really hard, uh, but I think it's worth it. I personally think that if your project is growing and you, have, and you can see the curve going up and more and more people are using, think about sharding earlier than later because you're migrating your data might be, or might be a lot of work. Right, because you have, you've got this huge database server and at some stage you have to migrate this all around your shards. You're not allowed to lose anything. Uh, so think about it rather than later. Uh, some, some links. Uh, probably the last one is the most important. You're going to fiddle around with this for ages. <laughs> and it's going to be, again, very frustrating. Uh, and yeah, what do you want to know? And thank you. And I spoke too fast. Questions? Yep. You mentioned that uh, the primary key thing is happening. I've never actually done this myself, but I don't think that much of the UI. Do the UI complete the UI? So, so the question is, uh, exactly. So have we got a picture of? So uh, basically, the question was, uh, why not use the primary key as a, your sharding no, 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 key? No, no, no. That's, that was not the question. Ah. No, it wouldn't because ideally in front of every database server, so the question was in Django there's this UUID key which is a unique key uh, generated by Django. And the, so ideally in this setup you wouldn't have one web server, right? Or even when one web process. Every database server would be serving N like web servers, right? So you have to imagine in a network diagram you'd have probably three to four web servers sitting in front of every database server. Of course they're linked up, right? But they're, they're, there's no way in Django, except using RabbitMQ or using uh, all the, I mean, different ways. I mean, there's um, all the caching framework stuff. Um, memcache, for example, is commit. So you can use memcache to do it, um, to find a unique key, uh, because the web servers will have different threads and all these threads will not be aware of all the other servers' threads being around. So what you can do, which lots of people do, is they have one table that generates their unique keys, and they just increment that. They use that for increment. Or a lot of people use memcache or other caching software to, to generate. I think you were referring to the UUID, the generic concept, not the Django feature. I don't know 
so, so like a generated your ID from randomness, and then you have a ah, you want statistically to, unique. Uh, statistically, but then you've got the problem, what happens if random isn't really random? Uh, and you get, set, get a second one, and <laughs> that's what we do, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> but I have a similar question. Why, don't, why couldn't you use the um, shark key as the foreign key? So you would distribute so, the shark key to all your... Um, so what, exactly. That's what, you, that's what we... Exactly, that's what we do too. So obviously this is massively simplified. Uh, what you can do is where can, we, where can we see this? Where's my foreign key stuff? What you can do is, for example, you can have this uh, positive integer field you can say the first n bits of this integer define my machine, and the other n bits are my, un my incrementing normal key. Uh, there are loads of different ways to solve this, and probably it always depends on the load you have, right? If you're going to expect millions of, of database shards at some stage, uh, you're going to have a different strategy than if you're just going to have 16. And uh, for example, our database config is not going to scale for 1,000 machines. We're not going to start adding. Uh, our, our unique key finding algorithm will not shard to a thousand shards. Uh, just because we sort of figured out we can grow machines and seeing the data growth we have, we can grow machines and we sort of know the sweet spot when we're going to hit problems. And that's so far in the future that uh, we decided not to bother about it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> So, uh, where, where I agree, I agree. Uh, I've done a lot with Mongo and Couch. And uh, so these are very, very nice uh, in this highly distributed environment. When we started this, this was a small project uh, I did on a weekend. And I just thought, I'm going to hack up something really easy. Then I gave it to a friend, and then the friend started using it, and then it started growing. And the problem is we had so many, when we ran into, when we sort of discovered this was a product in the first place, <laughs> we already had so many users that rewriting all the code that we'd written uh, for like Couch, for example, which I was looking at at the time, uh, would have been too much work. We were just growing at such a pace that we couldn't afford to basically rewrite all the database stuff. And for the problems we have, relational databases are quite nice because you, you have these advanced index features. And we have very structured data. And I should have maybe put in some, some frames or some slides about the problem set. But we have quite structured data. It's basically a title and a text. And these are ordered. So we do gain a lot through having relational structures and, and indexes on that. And for example, the whole backup we do, we just do with PostgreSQL and do replication with it, which uh, it is really easy to do. So. So basically, what, so basically, what we decided is we're not going to do backup in Django. What, we're going, what we decided is what we're going to do is we're going, going to do replication um, on the PostgreSQL level, because PostgreSQL is really, really, really good at having this streaming replication. And uh, obviously, you could do this with Couch or exactly the same. Uh, actually, looking back at it now, I would have probably used like a non-relational database. But we're stuck with it now. And I don't think we're going to ever rewrite it, uh, seeing the amount of work we've put into it. Um, so what we do is we do the replication. Uh, so table one is replicated actually on a really stupid thing <laughs> on the same machine. Obviously, table one should be replicated here. Um, so if this server goes down, we serve a replica. And then we've just got an IP uh, switching in front of it. So it will just sort of uh, switch the IP address if one server goes down. But PostgreSQL is really fast. So we have three replicas of all the data that just replicates streaming replication. And that seems to work quite nicely. But uh, I mean, there's nothing in this what rely on ACID. And so we could have used Couch or something. Yes. And I hate it. <laughs> it it's just. Uh, uh, so we had, A, we had performance issues with it which I found quite weird, uh, that it would just do weird things. Uh, it would just not do the, so A, the, the join pass would be weird in the database, which I didn't, I, couldn't re I didn't spend too much time on it, actually. I tried it, and it didn't perform well. 
And it seemed like not being scalable to uh, the level of machines we wanted to scale. So uh, at some stage, we can now add just a 17th, a third, or a hundredth machine. And at some stage, we'll hit the, a problem with unique keys and stuff. But this is fair, we can fairly easily calculate when we're going to hit this point. And I couldn't see it with, with, uh, with that. Yeah. yeah? What does your development setup look like? I mean, you hmm. obviously don't have all these uh, different machines when you're developing, but you should have something that's we have, looks a bit like it. Yes, we just, uh, so actually, what? where's my config file? This is actually taken from our development machine. So what we do is shards are tables in one big ProtoSQL server. And you can see from the ports, we, they all connect to localhost. They all connect, exactly. And then we have the logging on a different server, just, it's a, but it's all on one machine. So we run two ProtoSQL servers to the logging, and all the rest is tables or databases in one database server. And like this, we can really easily develop, because we've got the same config, in the development environment. And then we have, uh, in the settings file, we just have if production, basically, and we just replace localhost with the different shard servers. And obviously, we have authentication in front of it. <laughs> uh, but uh, so like this, we can really easily develop locally. And also, we can really easily get a sample set of the live production and put it on test. Because we have exactly the same setup for test. Test is one big machine. Again, with one date or two database servers on running on different ports, one for logging and one for all the data. Excellent. More questions? More? I've got one. Just a problem, maybe. Uh, yeah. Like, when you decide to forge certain shards, you kind of bake that into your um, domain model as well. Exactly. So you can't. So what we can do, so our shard key is a, a, a hash we generate by random. And um, what we do is we take the first uh, char from the shard key to decide which char we go. What we could, of course, do is take the next char, take the next two chars, and then we would basically multiply the servers. Does that make sense? I mean it to, to scale. Uh, exactly. No, I mean like it constraints what kind of features you can implement. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Because, exactly. Yeah, for example, you can't do anything across multiple projects, for example. No, so exactly. Exactly. So, no, we, no. So that's why you have to really. That's why, that's why I said the shard key is the most important thing you're, you're looking at. Because the shard key defines your whole performance, your whole uh, scalability. If we would now say we want to work on two projects at the same time, it, it basically would be the most worst thing we could do, right? Because <laughs> we'd be hitting two computer or two servers all the time. Exactly, but also by using uh, this, we can rebalance quite easily because we can just sort of do rerouting. Uh, so what we did at the beginning when we only had two machines, we just basically said we're going to split it here and these are going to be one server and these are going to be the next. And then we sort of split it again. And so by growing, we could sort of horizontally scale quite easily by just copying the database over, which was really nice. Uh, when we had like, we got an article on like a big news site and we, we just, it was just exploding. And I, I just had to change in the config file two lines, and we automatically had a new machine. Like, totally balanced everything. And right away, it all went down again, right? Uh, so doing it like this gives you a lot of advantages. But obviously, if you get a wrong shard key, uh, that's it. <laughs> and we hope that's never going to happen. But yeah, obviously, I mean, uh, like, like I said with Facebook, right? Uh, it's really, really hard for some projects to find the right shard key. And that's why uh, I don't know where my slide was. Really work on this. <laughs> really be aware. Really figure out what is your next. What are your next steps going to be? What are your next uh, things you're going to implement? Be, and try it. Try if it still works with that shard key. And I spend a lot of time doing this. And at some stage, as I said, we need a randomness here somewhere. We need a random char, or some randomness, so we can have an equal distribution on all the shards. And that's when we introduce this uh, this hash for every project. And of course, we can extend this to the length of the hash, right? <laughs> so we could have a few thousand servers, I suppose. Yeah. So around the fact that is it just the deterministic hash function, or do you really add in some uh, randomness? Yeah, yeah, we add u random and. Ah, 
hash. So the hash, the hash is a real random string. So you can actually use data from one project to calculate No, every project has a random hash, and we partition by the hash. So exactly. It, it, well, it's on, randomly, but it, it stays, it stays so the project always stays on one chart. Mm -hmm. Everything related to a project, pictures, uh, all different types of items we have are all attached to the hash and are all sharded by the hash. And that's why we put the decision where to, where to root to into the model. Because obviously in the model file we have pictures, texts, uh, all different types of, of classes basically, of models. And every model decides who am I attached to, right? So, uh, where was it? So here in the get shard, you basically get the project of the item of the uh, you're assigned to, right? So uh, this will be in an item, let's say a text item, right? And it's defined by the save function that every item needs a project, and so we get the project ID here, and then say, save me or put me onto there. Actually, I have a question. What, you, have, you have nothing like uh, you left from the project ID, which is some kind of... Uh, which, which is a unique, uh, globally unique. But yeah. uh, then you have to do a central, uh, look up at the central place to find out about the hash. So exactly. The That's why we've got the cache. So why don't you use the hash itself as the primary proof? Would you be able to just... We yeah, we, we, we thought about that, and that's what we actually do in the back end now. But, um, yeah, but, okay, this is actually... So actually what we've done now is we've used the hash. And so now we've got uh, hash, the projects. We had the problem that we had one project database where all projects were in. So what happened is the project database was just hammered because every lookup would just hammer. And what we've done now is we've got a key value store that's distributed, and we don't even use the project ID anymore. Uh, so what we do is we, on all the machines, we have a key value store that is balanced, and we use the hash to point to the different projects. And so we've distributed that now. So now, again, ran, we've still got network traffic. Ideally, it will be on the same machine, but we haven't done that yet. Uh, you still got one network traffic, but you don't hammer one machine anymore to find out all the project data. And that's why, we, in this example, we introduced this cache, because the memcache, again, is distributed and does it quite nicely. <laughs> So, uh, like self migration and yeah. yes. So that's incredibly easy. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you just add database shard one, shard two, shard three, shard four. Okay, yeah, yeah. So what I've done is I've written a full script, for, and I've just got a list of all my shards. And what I do is uh, I do an SSH onto the machine. And because our machines are sort of named, encoded the shard name into the machine, so I do is I SSH into the machine, I call the migration, and I call the database. When developing, this is very important. Only have your database routes properly set up, because if you do migrate and your database routes are not properly set up, you'll end up with data everywhere, and it doesn't work. So always set the database. Uh, this is probably a good habit anyway, if you're working on, on multiple databases. Never use this. Because this will always sort of fall through everything and, and ruin a lot of your life. Um, always, always use the database which you want to migrate. Uh, and you can do all the stuff, right? The only thing what you have to do, obviously, you, when you uh, do a new migration, you detect a new migration, you have to do it on the model, basically, and not run it on all the shards. Then. On, run on all, be sure to run the migration on all the shards, otherwise you're inconsistent. And be sure to, to do all the default values and everything the same, because it will query you for a default value and you might have set something else and you start rebalancing or start copying records over into different shards, uh, you'll get inconsistent data. Depends on the project. It told, so the last project I was in, we did CouchDB because it just made sense. Uh, this project, I don't know. I don't know. I think we gain a lot through relational databases because our lookups are really, really nice and fast. But we had, obviously, we had all this pain. Uh, the choice using Django sort of said we had to use a relational database because the object mappers for Django for Mongo are really, really bad. So uh, probably if I would do it now, I'd do, I wouldn't use Django anymore. I'd use the front end 
was Angular or some JavaScript framework, and do the back end was Couch. That would sort of, because that's interesting and hip right now, and I want to learn it. <laughs> this was really something I started on the weekend, and I knew Django, I knew all this technology, so I could just sort of kick it out really fast. And actually, the prototype, the first version that was used by loads of people, was actually something I, I wrote up uh, like a, over a weekend, Saturday night, pretty much. And then we had so many users that at some stage I decided this might become a project. And then the machine went down because we had too many people. And then we started doing all this stuff. So we were sort of stuck with uh, what we had. Uh, but uh, I don't know if, if, uh, if using Couch or something is really the solution for everything that is multi-server. Multi uh, my experience with Couch is that at some stage you hit a really big wall. <laughs> Uh, so we had a project where we had four servers that were rebalancing and then we had mobile phones syncing up and using the revision ID stuff and at some stage we just hit this and it all crashed and we never figured out why uh, uh, we just got around with it through doing some intelligent compression stuff but um, I don't think it's a, the ideal solution you should always look at your problem and then look at what you really want to achieve or what your where your bottlenecks are going to be but I can guarantee you one table is going to be huge and all the others are going to be small. <laughs> yeah. Um, one, one case, uh, one really huge something like Postgres, I think the code is really well uh, fine. Yeah. Like it's, it works, it's been working for so long now. Exactly. It's like bugs like that won't be there. Yeah, exactly. But um, one question, um, how do you handle rebalance if you were really sharp or something? Does uh, Postgres itself can't do that, right? No. No. We do that manually. So what we have is, if we, so if exactly, so what we at the beginning we we didn't use this and we really had to write migration scripts. So if you now we're we're sort of limited to to sixteen shards. If we would use the other two, we'd have to rebalance everything, obviously, and that's just a managed task. And we just go offline, we rebalance everything. <laughs> There's no no no. Uh, it's because. Uh, Actually, it's quite easy to predict users, it turns out, or user sort of development. So we can quite easily, we've got this Excel file where we can quite easily plot how many users we can sort of stomach. Because uh, assuming that users are random, which they normally are, we, from historical data, we can sort of know we're going to have so many power users, we're going to have so many people that just log in once, try it, or we're going to have so many people that are going to sort of use it. So we quite well, we know quite well what the mix is going to be of these users, and we know quite well what the requirements are going to be. And because we use the random key, we know how fast the shards are going to fill up. So we can sort of quite, uh, if, I don't know, maybe if the TechCrunch has this huge article on us, we're going to all crash, I don't know. But um, so we can quite, we know when our break even point is going to be and when we need new shards, and, uh, or when we need to shard further and get, go to more machines. So as soon as you've sort of committed on your shard set in this example, you're fixed with it. Otherwise, you have to write a script to rebalance. And that works. I mean, it works. It's, it's a lot of fiddly sort of, but at the end of the day, you just do a select on the database, give me everything that looks like this, and copy it over to the next database. So what you could actually do, you could emulate it through views or stuff like that, uh, which we didn't do. But what I thought after that, we could have done views and just copied the view over, which apparently PostgreSQL can do now. Uh, which I haven't played around with. Other questions, ideas, feedback? Cool. Actually, I'm on time now. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you ever so much. Cheers.